A lot of people say, how can Jane Austen be a universal writer? Look at her milieu, it's so small. That's the point. She, she works within an extremely restricted milieu. It's not even grand aristocracy, it's rather usually faded or small or very, very high upper middle class. So it's so little you could do, the little minuet that the characters can dance is so constrained. She's painted herself, you'd think, into a corner, but it's, um, it's a corner where great fruit bloom. That just makes no sense as an image, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Jane Austen is like, quite a find, I think. Good afternoon, Frederica. Good afternoon, Mother. It was really exciting to not just be in a Jane Austen, but also one that hadn't been done before, because I knew all the others so well. I think that it's quite different from the Austens. It feels like a fielding. It feels like Tom Jones or Joseph Andrews. It feels quite picaresque. It moves really fast. <laughs> Lots of characters. I feel like at the start of the film, perhaps there should be like a family tree or something. <laughs> you know, like sometimes in novels we have that so you can reference them. I'm not sure how they're going to do that, but hopefully people will be able to keep up. tricky, isn't it, because the characters are all intertwined in so many different ways, and it really is an ensemble piece. Lady Susan Vernon, congratulations on being about to receive the most accomplished flirt in all England. The character of Lady Susan is just so brilliant. She's so interesting and so flawed and so multi-layered. And then um, Frederick is kind of the polar opposite, so I think their relationship, or their non-relationship in a way, is really interesting. An offer as splendid as Sir James's is not likely to come around again. He has offered you the one thing he has of value to give, his income. The thing about Lady Susan is that, unusually for romantic literature, is that she's sort of at core not really a very good person, and yet she's kind of celebrated. Good, let's just do another sit down. It's very good. I really like writing extravagant female characters. I really like people who are kind of outrageous. She's beautiful, as I say. You worry me, Reginald. Don't. I understand Lady Susan possesses a degree of Captivating deceit, which might be pleasing to detect. You truly worry me. Good evening. What charming expressions. She did, I think, enjoy and feel entitled to a certain amount of sexual and personal freedom that is not usually admitted to at that time. Sometimes I think you need people to make things happen, even if their motives are horribly bad and, and openly bad. And I love people who are charming and can convince others of anything. There's a certain pleasure in making a person predetermined to dislike instead acknowledge one's superiority. How delightful it will be to humble the pride of these pompous de Courcy's. They cook up various plots to try and detach young Reginald from the, the clutches of the wicked Lady Susan. I moved behind the scenes uh, with his mother to try and head off this catastrophe. Uh, I must go. No, I'll write. No, no, this is happening. Uh, there's no time. Alicia is Lady Susan's best friend and confidant. I think maybe her only real friend. What I really liked about the process with this film is we had a script we liked, but then before the shoot and during the shoot, it kind of changed based on the actors and what was happening. In the novel, the Alicia Johnson character wasn't fully described, and making her this American Tory exile kind of a shocking character, it really seemed to go with what Chloe would do, and it, it added something. It wasn't just that we're avoiding having the struggle of doing British accents, but it adds like a, a dimension to the story. You didn't receive my letter. Letter? Mr. Johnson forbids my seeing you. Oh, that's preposterous. By what means forbids? He threatens the severest punishment imaginable. Sending me back to Connecticut. His wife, Alicia, he keeps on a string of threats and <laughs> I think, poor thing. I'm sorry to say, my dear, that I hear the Atlantic Passage is very cold at this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, which 
likes in what I did is that I tend to play, I tend to play slightly sort of useless bumbling men, and my character in this is a useful bumbling man, so maybe that's a step up in my career. There is a saying, the heart has its strangeness, or words to that effect. The heart is an instrument we possess, but do not truly know. Human love partakes of the divine, or at least it has in my case. Yes, Emma plays my wife, and uh, I think she tolerates me as a husband, as an actor. Justin is hilarious and very tall, so it's very fun to dance with him, because he can really swing you around. <laughs> That was the best thing ever. I actually can't dance, but I can historical dance, because it is just one foot in front of the other, and it was my favorite scene. Excuse me, Frederica. When I came down this morning, I noticed you were reading a book. Which book was that? With casting of an actor named Tom Bennett for the part of Sir James Martin, he kind of created this character that practically didn't exist on the page. I beg you! <sighs> I kept getting ideas for Sir James Martin, so all these Sir James Martin scenes kept coming into the script. Sir James, allow me to introduce my sister-in-law, Mrs. Catherine Vernon, and her brother, Mr. Reginald de Courcy. How do you do? How do you do? A kind of you to ask. Uh, excellent. Truly, very well. Thank you. Because Wit wrote the screenplay, I think he knows exactly what he wants, and I think he's heard the words in his head, and so when he achieves that with the actor, that's when he's happy. You mean sort of synthetic, if you're a little more intimidated or fearful? Yes. I just have so much admiration for him, and I like being around him, and I like when he's happy, and you can sense that he's pleased with what he's getting in the day, and when he's frustrated, I feel that really deeply, and <laughs> he's gonna think that I'm horribly sentimental. <laughs> But I do, and um, so I'm really like, I'm always rooting for him. Okay, excellent. Characters in his other films talk about Austin a lot and, and argue about Austin. So Austin is obviously, there's, there's, a, there's a direct line through, I think. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Stop. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Welcome, ladies. I think I was in love with Oscar Wilde's plays before I knew about Jane Austen. Love and Friendship is almost more understandable as Jane Austen, Oscar Wilde piece. It's like, it's what we think of as Oscar Wilde. But Jane Austen wrote it many years before Oscar Wilde. I think that Lady Susan has a great deal in common with the British novelistic uh, and indeed dramatic tradition of what used to be called without embarrassment, the comedy of manners. And it's worth remembering that the Latin for manners is mores. We get our word morals from it. So comedies of manners are comedies of morals. They're not just light drawing room society comedies. These things make, of course, magnificent entertainments as films because you can delight in the character's lack of self-knowledge and we can all applaud ourselves for seeing how little these characters understand themselves, let alone each other. And we can also actually love them and want them to come together in the right way, which is what comedy provides us with a, a suggestion that society will heal the wounds that, uh, that a lack of self-knowledge has created. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Kate Beckinsale. Thank you. Amazing. It's been an amazing five weeks and one day. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, officially, that's a wrap. Thank you. Congratulations, Rick. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. It's amazing being the official. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>